Hello everyone, how are you? Thank you so much for joining me today. I am glad that you are here. Happy Wednesday to each and every one of you. You guys know what Wednesday is. Wednesdays means that we are in the Word because we are what? In the Word on Wednesday. Good morning, good morning, good afternoon. How are you? Thank you so much for joining me today. So we are starting a new series. You know that that is something that I did when I first started off and we were doing, for example, prayers for our husbands, prayers for our wives, prayers for our students. Well, now we are starting a new series and that new series is Trusting God and the various ways that we trust God for all of the ways in which he is able to show us that he is in fact a trustworthy God. So I hope that you will enjoy the next few weeks and what I want to share with you. So we're going to give a few minutes for everyone to get in the room. So while that happens, let me remind you to do a few things and then I will take a moment to introduce myself. Number one, if you are not already doing so, make sure you tap on those three little dots down there. I call them my Perry Ushers. Make sure that you are one following me so that you will get the notifications. If you've noticed that you haven't heard the little notification sound lately, then perhaps you accidentally unfollowed or it has dropped. It happens. No worries. Make sure that you're following me now. The second thing, number two, thanks name Max 45 is invite your followers. Share this out with your audience, with your community, with your followers, and let them get a little bit of biblical motivation for midweek. Now, if you guys don't know who I am and you happened upon me, then you are in a great place for the day. Wednesdays, I call it Wednesday in the world word because this is the day that I come to you as a pastoral counselor as a Christian empowerment coach. And what is that? A pastoral counselor is an ordained minister that is also a mental health practitioner. So not only do I assist you with things dealing with uh, spiritual development, but also with your mental health, like anxiety, depression, PTSD, and all of that. As a Christian empowerment coach, I teach you how to take these beautiful words of scripture off of the page, place them in our hearts, and make it a part of our day-to-day -day life. Now, others of you may know me from Daily Spark with Dr. Angela, that's on in Atlanta, as well as in Central City, or perhaps you know me from Daily Spark TV, that's on in Northern Virginia and Washington, D.C. If you support those other programmings that I offer, thank you so much for that. I do appreciate that. If you want to know more about me, you can always visit DrAngelaChester.com, that's DrAngelaChester.com. You can follow me on social media on most platforms like Facebook and Twitter. I'm Dr. Angela Chester. If you follow me on Instagram, I'm Dr. Angela C. I would love to be able to talk to you more, so simply follow me on those other platforms. Now, what is a Wednesday in the Word? I'm going to ask you one more, again, one more time. Wednesday in the Word is when we do what? We are in the Word on Wednesdays because we want to be motivated. We want to be able to get from Sunday to Sunday with a little extra in between to keep us going. So let's go on and get started. So trusting God. This is a midweek Bible study, if you will. Um, I do topical Bible studies so that we can all be on the same page. You may catch a little bit later. And instead of having you have to go back and catch, read all those chapters to get caught up, you can simply listen in your drive time. You can listen on your way to work. You can listen during your lunch period and still be able to be on the same page with us. And today we're talking, or this particular series, we're talking about trust. So I'm going to take a few minutes just to make sure that we understand what are the possibilities of trust. How does the word trust incorporate into our lives? What is the biblical meaning of trust? And how do we understand what we are about to learn? So trust as a noun. Trust as a noun means confidence, a reliance or resting of the mind on the integrity, the justice, the friendship, or other sound principle of another person. It is confidence, reliance, or the resting of the mind on the integrity, justice, friendship, or other sound principle of another. I think that is such a wonderful definition of what it means to trust. 
Number two, um, that is a, a ground of confidence. A ground of confidence. Number three, a charge received in confidence. A charge, a directive, an instruction that is received in confidence. Confident opinion of an event. A confident opinion of an event. Next, credit given without examination. To trust is credit given without an examination. As to take opinions on trust. You're simply going to trust that it is going to be a certain way because someone else has said that it's going to be that way and you believe that person to be of sound judgment. Do you understand what I mean by that? Credit given without examination. Trust is also credit on a promise of payment, actual or implied, as in to take a purchase in good trust. It is something committed to a person's care for use or management and for which an account must be rendered. It is something committed to a person's care for use or management for which an account must be rendered. Now, I just kind of preached on that a few weeks ago when we were talking about giving, and more people are familiar with the story of giving the money, giving the coins, and the servant taking those coins and doing something with those coins, right? The one that went and multiplied the coin, and then the ones that didn't do anything with the coin, right? So they were... Uh, uh, he, they were trusted with this money. They were trusted to do something with the coin. That they were um, given management or use of that coin. And they needed to create an account. They needed to do something that was going to make that work. The last definition is a confidence or a reliance upon one's honesty. Confidence. A reliance upon one's honesty honesty. Now, when we trust someone, don't we tend to do that? When we trust someone, we feel as though that person is a trustworthy person. We feel that there is a certain amount of honesty in the words that they say and in the things that they do because we are trusting them with our fill in the words. Anything from our children, our car, our home, um, our time, our emotion, because we believe that what we're getting in return from that person is something that is honest and true. Now, you can also use the word trust as a verb, and there's only three very brief meanings that ultimately we will be going over, and that is to believe or to credit, to commit to the care of, and to venture confidently, to venture confidently, as in many of us drive through a tunnel or on a bridge or on a freeway, we have a trust that, that, will, that our commute will be okay. If you take a ferry from one side of the harbor to the other, you venture confidently on that ferry because you trust in the integrity of the ferry. You trust that the ferry is in good repair and that you will be able to go from one side to the other. All right, so there we go. Those are the definitions of the word trust that we will be using throughout the entire series. So I want you to turn in your Bibles to Genesis 15. And we are looking at verses 1 through 7. Genesis chapter 15, verses 1 through 7. Now, you, of course, can use any translation that you like. You can choose um, your phone or you can flip in a Bible if you so desire. Um, I happen to like flipping in a Bible if it is convenient for me. Um, the translation is not as important. I want to make sure that you do follow along as best you can, though. Now, I will be reading out of the amplified version this time, the amplified version, which means I will probably have a lot of little extra words that I will be reading to you to make this crystal clear. Okay, I'm using the Amplified Version. Genesis 15, verses 1 through 7. Genesis is the first book of the Bible. You're simply going to go into chapter 15. And we're going to start at the very beginning. The header should read something like this. Abram promised a son. Here we go. Yes. Thank you, Jonathan. The Amplified Bible. Hey, you know what? 
Um, sometimes it's A M B and sometimes it's A M P. Okay, for amplified, sometimes it's the abbreviation of amp, and then it's amplified Bible. Mm -hmm. So either one of those will work. Thank you. Genesis fifteen one through seven. Here we go. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward for obedience shall be very great. Abram said, Lord, God, what reward will you give me? Since I am leaving this world childless, and he who will be the owner and heir of my house is this servant, Eliza, from Damascus. And Abram continued, Since you have given no child to me, one, a servant, born in my house, is my heir. Mm -hmm. Then behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This man, Eliza, will not be your heir, but he, will, but he who shall come from your own body will be your heir. And the Lord brought Abram outside his tent into the night and said, Look now towards the heavens and count the stars, if you are able to count them. And he said to him, So numerous shall your descendants be. Then Abram believed in a firm trusted in, relied on, remained steadfast to the Lord. And he counted, credited it to him as righteous, doing right in regard to God and man. And he said to him, I am the same Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land as an inheritance. Abram outside and said to him, Look up into the sky and count the stars if you can. That's how many descendants you will have. And Abram believed the Lord, and the Lord counted him as righteous because of his faith. And then the Lord told him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldees to give you this land as your possession. Now, the one thing that I really, really like about God is that he has a tendency to repeat himself. When it is really, really, really important, he doesn't just say it once. Sometimes he says it two times. Sometimes when Jesus is speaking, he will even say it three or four times. Not only does he repeat the same words, meaning that he uses the exact same thing and says exactly what he said. But sometimes he uses different words that have the same context and the same meaning so that if you didn't catch it the first time, because sometimes we heard what you said, but we didn't understand what you said. So many times, especially if you're talking to me, if I think that someone is confused, I will say, can you say what you said differently? Tell it to me again, but say it a little bit different. I think someone may have a question. Because sometimes your, your use of words might cause confusion or there's a more, um, a better way to say what you're trying to say so that you can clarify your statement better. So let's take a look at this. So we look at this and first of all, we understand that we are talking to Abram. We are talking to Abram. We are not talking to Abraham yet. Okay, so we are at the beginning stages. Okay, so there hasn't been that transformation of name. So we are talking to Abram. We, but it is Abraham, just for those of you who don't know. We are talking about one and the same. But there comes a time where his name changes. Okay, so we're talking to Abram, right? And the Lord came to him in a vision. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, 
saying, do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield. So can God come to us in various ways? Absolutely. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. So sometimes God will come to us and it will be in a song that you hear. It could be in an evangelism moment like this is now and you're watching on Periscope or you're listening to a podcast or you're watching something on TV. It can come from a mere stranger when you're standing in line and that person has a word for you, but you don't realize that until you kind of get in your car and you go, oh my goodness, that, that was the word I was looking for. That was the confirmation I was looking for. But God is also able to, of course, come to you very personally. Able to come to you very personally in sounds and songs. Yes, in sounds and songs. If, if, that is, if that is how God determines that he wants to come to you. So do not be afraid. I am your shield. I am your covering. I am the protector of you and all that you have going on in your world. I love that. Your reward for your obedience, and this is why I chose to use the Amplified this time, because I want you to understand the smallest little bits of syntax here. So he says, I am your shield and your reward, your reward for what? For your obedience shall be not just great, but very great. So Abram says, Lord, what reward are you going to give me? Like, what are you, what are you talking about? Because I'm leaving this world childless. Like what else, what else could you give me? I don't have, I don't have any children. That's the thing I don't have. I don't have any children. So I'm going to leave everything to this man, right? I'm going to leave everything in my home to this man named Eliza from Damascus. Now, sometimes it reads as Eliza Damascus. Sometimes it reads Damascus Eliza. Same person. It's like Jesus of Nazareth, the Nazarene Jesus. Do you understand what I'm saying? Because sometimes they're putting um, the location in with the name. So since you have no child, there's no heir. I'm going to leave it to this person. But then God comes in and says, oh, but I will bless you. I will give you a reward and I will give you a child. And you, I will give you this child and this child will be of your loins and this will be your legitimate heir. This child will come from your own body. But the thing that I really, really love is how the Lord took Abram outside. Outside of the tent. He's not inside where he's sheltered, limited, and in a box, if you will. Okay? The way that we say it, like being in a box. He took him outside into the night. Outside of the tent into the night and said, Now look towards the heavens and count the stars if you are able to count them. Now I don't know about you, but I know about me. And I don't have the ability to count the stars. I can't see all the stars. I don't believe I even have the patience to try to count all the stars. And it seems like it would be a task that is just overwhelming. Where would you start? And how would you guarantee that before the sun rises that you would be able to have an accurate count? Because someone's going to call you, your phone's going to ring, you're going to have to use the restroom. Things are going to happen, right? So I see how he is putting before him this task that humanly seems impossible. But why does God do that? He does that because he's saying, I'm needing you to again trust me. But I'm going to ask you to be, I'm going to ask you to do something that can be a daily or nightly reminder to you of this conversation that we're having right now. So every time nighttime comes and you look up at the stars, you will be reminded of the conversation that you and I, God and Abram, you will be reminded of the conversation that we have had. So if you try to take the time to even count the stars, guess what? I am going to bless you even more than that. Look now toward the heaven and count the stars if you are able to count them. Then he says to him, they are so numerous and so shall your descendants be. Now, to me, that is like a whoa moment. You're going to give me more descendants than there are stars? 
wow, that's a God statement. Nobody else can tell you anything like that. You're going, I don't, I don't have enough wives. I don't have any children right now. And I don't have enough wives. I'm starting to get a little up there in age. And you are you want me to have enough children to outnumber the stars? Okay, God, I'm going to trust because you are telling me and not because it is a human being. Then Abram believed in. You ready for this one? This is why Amplified is important. Then Abram believed in, affirmed, trusted in, relied on, and remained steadfast to the Lord. Okay? He counted and credited it towards him as righteousness, doing right in regard to God and man. So the trust has been established. Remember that definition that I gave you that sometimes, sometimes it will be trust means as a noun to give credit given without examination. Given credit without examination and to trust for use or management when an account is to be rendered. So Abram decided that he was going to trust God without any other other um, proof needed other than the fact that God himself said it. I don't need anything else because you are my God. Because you have done all other things that you said that you would do. So therefore, I will trust you without proof on this. Because why should I dis? Why should I distrust you? Why shouldn't I believe that you're going to do exactly what you said that you were going to do? Now, nowadays we say, well, I can trust God because God is not a man and he will not lie to us. We know that to be true because we have all of these stories plus our own personal accounts. But remember, this is in the moment, right? So look up into the sky and count the stars if you can. That's how many descendants you will have. And Abram was blessed because of his faith. What a beautiful way to start your trust relationship with mm -hmm. the Lord. Yes, yes, definitely. Because God is faithful each and every day. Each and every day. Let's continue on looking at trust. We're staying in the book of Genesis. I now want you to turn over to Genesis 22, 1 through 8. We're looking at Genesis 22, verses 1 through 8. And of course, I am reading again out of the Amplified. Thank you so much for my heart. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We're looking at Genesis 22, 1 through 8. And I'm reading out of the Amplified. This is the offering of Isaac. Now some people are pronouncing and say Isaac, Isaac. Now after these things, God tested the faith and commitment of Abraham and said to him, Abraham. And he answered, here I am. God said, Take now your son, your only son of promise, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham got up early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. And he split the wood for the burnt offering, and then he got up and went to the place on which God had told him. On the third day of travel, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. Abraham said to his servants, settle down and stay here with the donkey. The young man, the young man and I will go over there and worship God, and we will come back to you. Then Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and laid it on the shoulders of Isaac, his son. And he took the fire, the fire pot, in his own hand and the sacrificial knife. And the two of them walked together. And Abraham said, I'm sorry, and Isaac said to Abraham, 
my father. And he said, here I am, my son. Isaac said, look, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham said, my son, God will provide for himself a lamb for the burnt offering. So the two walked on together. Now, I want you to picture for a moment the fact that God just told you that you need to take your son or your daughter for that matter, your only son or daughter of promise, of promise. Remember, we were just talking about this in chapter 15. I don't have a child. Who am I supposed to leave anything to? By the time we're in chapter 22, you now have a child of promise. Now, why is it important that they say of promise? Because we understand that Sarah, in her humanness, tried to fix the problem. <laughs> and along comes Ishmael. Some people say Ishmael. But the son of promise, the one that God promised to Abraham, is the son named Isaac yes. or Isaac. He is the son of promise. So I'm not asking you to sacrifice the child that you created, that you thought would be a, a, a great solution to end the fact that you didn't have any children. I'm asking you to sacrifice the child that I, God, promised you. Amen. The one who actually is the heir to all that you have. Yeah. The one that I told you that I would give to you and that through his line would be as numerous as the stars are in the sky. I want you to take that son whom you love. Isaac and go to Mount Moriah, go to the region of Moriah and offer him as a burnt offering. You are taking with you not just your fire pot, not just your, you know, your fire pit, not just your wood, but you are taking a sacrificial knife. Not the knife that you usually cut your meats with and prepare your meals, but a special sacrificial knife that you would usually use, follow me now, to slit the throat of the sacrificial lamb. You're the parent, and God has told you these things. Can you imagine that moment, that morning? It ain't a lot of pep in your step. Not a lot of zip in your walk. You're probably begrudging that day. You don't want to do it, but you know that you have to do it. You know that you have to get up. You know that you have to make these moves. Why? Because God has told you to do something. How many times has God told us to do something in our lives that isn't even quite as heavy as this, and we didn't want to do that? Yeah. Yes, you need to stand up and you need to speak up for your neighbor. You need to speak up for your community. You need to speak up for seniors or children or homeless or whatever it is. Or this time, you need to sit down and take your stance. You need to be in place. You need to be the person that has worked up to that particular position because I need you to take a stand by simply sitting down and being in that place. There are so many things that God asks us to do along the way of our journey. And so many times we don't do it. Let's be honest. We don't do it because we're hard headed. And then we wonder why the solution didn't turn out the way that we thought. Because you didn't do that thing. But then other times we try to do the hard thing that God has called us to do. We try to do that thing even though we really deep down inside don't want to do it. But we're trying to trust God. I believe that in this moment that Abraham was as human as any father or mother would be in that moment of, I really don't want to do this. But what does Abraham say? I believe that God will provide for himself a lamb for the burnt offering. A lamb for this offering. 
That is Abraham's way of trying to reassure his son at this moment because his son doesn't know what's about to happen, but Abraham does. So he's trying to keep his son calm and go, God will provide. Now, some back text to that. Many times there were lambs or rams that got caught in the bushes in the area of Mount Moriah. Okay, just because of the terrain. So it was something that was quite easy for him to say and that would be quite believable. Okay, now for us, we would think like, oh my goodness, that's just, oh, how random. It was purposeful yet random all at the same time. And I hope you follow what I'm saying. This is something that was plausible. It was something that could happen. It didn't mean that every time you went up there, there was just going to be this, this sheep caught there waiting for you to make the sacrifice. Most of the time, people brought their own lamb, which is why Isaac asked, where is it? But Isaac did not believe because there is a possibility that the ram could already be there if we wait along long enough. So he tells everyone else to stay down at the bottom because this is not for them to witness. This is not for them to tell about it. This is a test for Abraham. This isn't even a test for Isaac because Isaac doesn't know what's going on. This is a test for Abraham. And how many times do we go through a test that other people don't even know that they are playing a vital role in the test that we are taking that God has given to us? Our job is to do that which God has called us to do and to take on the role however we are called to take on that role. I love how Abraham continues to walk. He continues, and I'm sure in his mind, he is praying a prayer saying, Lord, Lord, I trust you. I believe in you. I don't know what is happening, but I trust that perhaps you will come to a solution before I have to take the life of my child. Not only take the life of his child, but provide him as the offering. Can't imagine. So, Let's keep going in the story. You ready? We're looking at 9 through 14. 9 through 14. Why do I have it broken down like this? Because there are bits and pieces along the way that there's different forms of trust that Abraham is displaying. Genesis 22, 9 through 14. Amplified version. Here we go. When they came to the place for which God had told him, Abraham built an altar there, arranged the wood, and bound Isaac, his son, and placed him on the altar on top of the wood. Abraham reached out his hand, took the knife to kill his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, he answered, here I am. The Lord said, do not reach out with the knife in your hand against the boy and do nothing to harm him. For now I know that you fear God with reverence and profound respect. Since you have not withheld from me your son, your only son of promise. Then Abraham looked up, glanced around and behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering, a sending sacrifice instead of his son. So Abraham named that place, the Lord will provide. And it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord, it will be seen and it will be provided. The Lord will provide. We know that as Jehovah Jireh. Yes, yes. The Lord will provide. In those, in those moments where we're unsure, in those moments where we see that we've done all that we could do, all that we could do that is humanly possible, and we understand that we have to step out in faith and in trust that God will do the rest. But again, sometimes we have to step out and we have to do that thing that causes us to just go, 
Please, God. Please. Please. I can't imagine. I can't imagine. We think about Jesus dying on the cross and how God gave his only son. And we say we can't imagine. Well, here's the human form as well. I cannot imagine wrapping his little hands, getting him ready, just like you would get ready as sheep, and picking him up and putting him on the altar. Can you imagine what Isaac was feeling when he realized that at that moment that he was the sacrifice? Yes, yes. And that he couldn't run down the mountain to go to the servants and the donkeys, but that Isaac in himself had to believe in his father yes. enough Amen. to believe that his father would in some way figure out how to do what was best for all and still honor God. Do you see how in trusting God that it is not just about you, that it becomes a generational thing? If you have generational blessings, you have generational cursings, but you also have generational faith. He taught his son in that moment that even when we don't want to do what we have been called to do, we must trust God no matter what. We must trust that God will provide for us a ram in the bush, yes. a person on the corner, money in the bank, a ride to that store, food in our pantry, or a prayer in our heart. Amen. We must understand that believing and trusting in God is what we have to do. It is what we need to do. And more importantly, it is what we have been called to do. What a beautiful story this yes. is. And this is why I broke it down into these little pieces so that you could see and understand and wrap your head around it instead of just, you know, reading straight through to get on to chapter 23. A ram in the bush. If you've ever heard that phrase, this is where it comes from. This is why that ram is so important. Jehovah Jireh, God will provide. Now, I have one more bit that I want to share with you. Before I do, I want to ask you to do two simple things. If you're not following, please be sure you're following. Tap the three little dots. If you haven't shared, make sure you share this out with your friends, with your followers, with your audience. Perhaps they need to be provided, to, they need to be reminded today that God does provide and that we can trust him and that he will make a way even when we don't see that there is a way. Let's get back to our scripture. We're still in Genesis 22. We're looking at verses 15 through 19. I'm reading out of the Amplified Version. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time and said, By myself, on the basis of who I am, I have sworn an oath, declares the Lord, that since you have done this thing and have not withheld from me your son, your only son of promise, Indeed, I will greatly bless you, and I will greatly multiply your descendants like the stars of the heavens and like the sands on the seashore. And your sea shall possess the gate of their enemies as conquerors. Through your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed, because you have heard and obeyed my voice so abraham returned to his servants and they got up and went with him to beersheba and abraham settled in beersheba isn't that awesome yes isn't that awesome yes Amen. not only did god say look up but he also said look down just as numerous as the sands of 
the seashore. There's another thing that I don't think anyone's gonna get around to counting anytime soon. We have a hard enough time counting how many jelly beans are in this container to win the prize, right? Can you imagine the seashore? God is telling you that I am going to bless you more than you can ever imagine. I am going to be able to bring so much through you than you could ever imagine. Simply because you did what I asked you to do. Because you have heard my voice and you have heeded my voice. You have done that which I've asked you to do and you did not keep anything from me. You brought it all to the table exactly as instructed. How many times have we forgotten to do that? Do we say, well, Lord, I want you to help me with this, but we try to hold on to a little, a little bit, a little piece behind for whatever reason, because we think that we can deal with it or we don't want to take it all to God because we don't want to seem like we're worrying God. Or is it because sometimes we just don't trust that God can handle all of it? We try to make him a little bit more human. We try to put him in a box and confine him and limit him and put boundaries on what God can do. The boundaries are only on us. We can only go so far in our humanness before we are required, before it is the only thing left to do. And it is in those moments that we find that if we can humble ourselves and go to our creator and ask for that thing, that which is righteous, God will hear our prayers. God will give to us what he has promised us and it will come to pass. Mm -hmm. I hope that you have enjoyed week number one on trusting God and how awesome our God can be. Now, as they say here in the South, God willing in the creek don't rise. We will be back here next Wednesday for Wednesday in the Word because we are what? in the word on wednesday oh thank you so much for that thank you i hope that you have enjoyed it and of course you can always share this even if it's a rebroadcast until next time everyone i want you to have our neighborhood your neighborhood as well until next time everyone bye bye